happy Aloha Friday, everyone, and welcome to join. Uh, thank you for joining us today at Strengthening the Coordinated Community Response Across Hawaii 2022 webinar series. Um, today is part two of Bridging the Gap, How to Build and Sustain Effective Multidisciplinary Collaboration, uh, presented by Julie German, German and Erica Olson. Let me swap my, myself. Okay. Uh, my name is Makwai Namahoy, and I will be serving as a facilitator for you folks. Let me switch slides. Hey. Uh, first, I would like to thank the organizers of this training. This training series was created as an effort informed by domestic violence fatality review stakeholders from across the state and is presented through a partnership between the Hawaii State Department of Health, the Hawaii State Judiciary, and provided by Hawaii Public Health Institute. Our sponsors for, who are providing continuing education credits, uh, we want to thank the Hawaii Public Health Training Hui, the Western Region Public Health Training Center, and the Public Health Learning Network. I was going to kick it off and get right started. I want to give it, hand it over to our guest trainers, uh, Julie and Erica, and they will lead us right into part two. All right. Well. Uh, welcome, everybody. We're so grateful that you had us back for a second week, and we're very glad to be here with you. And we're really excited. I think this second part of the training is um, super fun and just filled with some great skills. And so we hope that on this Friday the 13th, you're going to leave here uh, feeling like you spent your day uh, in a good way. So to start out, um, we just wanted to do a little icebreaker to use the mentee again and to get everybody in there. So um, if you want to go to a separate browser or on your smartphone and enter the code, go to menti.com, enter the code 6080-7085 and answer the question, if you could have superpower that you want, what would it be? So apologies, everybody. My I um, I'm presenting from a different place than my home last time, and so my um, my screen froze. So I apologize if I wasn't communicating, and you are communicating with me. Um, as you guys are talking about your superpower, I think maybe now mine might be that I could have instant internet at my fingertips anytime, anywhere for today. So, um, but again, if you just use your browser or your smartphone, type in that code. What superpower? Teleportation, people. flying. Yeah. Ooh, talk with animals. I, I talk to my dog all the time, so it would be nice to know what he was thinking. wand. We definitely have some Harry Potter fans out there. Never take a bad selfie. Now that's an amazing <laughs>
my kids mind see reading me all the time because my selfie skills are poor. They're just poor. <laughs> I've seen your pictures. I thought they're pretty good. I'm going to have to differ with them. I'll talk with animals. That would be beautiful. To blow things up. <laughs> I think we all might want that from time to Someone, time. <laughs> yes. A few people with uh, invisibility or the ability to vanish. Oh, here's grant a blessing. That's very selfless. That's very cool. That's, I think that's a new one for me. Yes. And not put on weight. <laughs> <sighs> Well, um, thanks for all of those who participated. Uh, just like last week, we're gonna use Menti a couple more times throughout the presentation. So you can always leave that separate browser open or you can close it as well and you'd just be required then to re-enter the code the next um, Menti question that we get to. And today we're really gonna be talking a lot about skills. And so I, I kind of like to think that we're going to give you all some superpowers that you can take back to your multidisciplinary work. Um, it might not be the power of flight, and we strongly suggest that you don't try flying, um, <laughs> but we do think we're going to give you some, some skill. Well, at least try to boost your human powers, even if we can't give you superpowers. Um, and I do just want to say at the outset, my apologies if my internet cuts in and out. Julie is an amazing captain. If for some reason I'm not talking, I'll catch back in. But I think it's also a nice way to remind us that we are human. Sometimes things don't always go as planned. So I just wanted to say that in advance if I can't type fast enough. And uh, apologies in advance if it, if it freezes up a little more. But Julie, I know you can pitch in anytime because why? I because will. you are an amazing support. <laughs> um, so we we teased out a little bit last time with the bridge design, just to sort of refresh your memory, and that we have spam, design, and supports. And so today, what we want to talk about are supports for your multidisciplinary team or your coordinated community response. And really our supports, just like a bridge, um, are made up of maybe some specific elements. So really when we think about it, we, we wanna think about it in sort of three ways. Uh, one is your people. The second is the culture of your group or organization. And third are skills. And so what I mean by this is that unlike um, really a span or or even designed to a certain extent, supports are gonna come and go, right? Supports are gonna change. They may rust out over time. There might be new materials available. And this is where you might find a lot of flexibility, um, but it'll also really help you strengthen your team. So they may change over time. Oh, um, and so what we'll talk about in terms of thinking about that bridge analogy, when we look at people, we're gonna be thinking about who should be at the table. Who should you be inviting or bringing in to uh, the broader coordinated community response? Looking at sort of who should do what roles and responsibilities and what can they bring to the table and, and then decision making authority and how you get that right balance really between some organization structure and process, um, as well as maybe a little bit more of the egalitarian power dynamics. Next, we're going to look at culture. And we're going to talk about a culture of blame and shame versus a culture of accountability. And we're going to look at approaching um, social issues and systemic change, as well as work with each other from a place of inquiry versus judgment. And then last, we're going to take a look at skills. And primarily for today's session, we're really going to be looking at communication and interpersonal skills. So we're going to kick it off with thinking about the people, um, and as Erica mentioned, the people that we want to bring to the table. So kind of a unique characteristic of domestic violence is isolation. Domestic violence tends to occur in isolation, and then it isolates the victims from community life. 
So countering this pervasive isolation with a coordinated community response is perhaps the strongest way uh, to eliminate domestic violence from our society. The whole community must become alerted to the problem and how to best support our victims and convey to abusers that, that one, abuse is a crime that's never justified, and two, that it's not going to be tolerated in our community. And so, as I mentioned to you last week, when we talked about people a little bit, we said, you know, this idea of a coordinated response might start with an individual or a couple individuals who are your spark people. And then you're going to get your little core team together, your kindling to your fire, and that may be your criminal justice partners. Um, but really, one of the key differences between coordinated community response and any other multidisciplinary work that you may have been part of in the past, like a sexual assault response team or a domestic violence response team, is really the addition of more community stakeholders. So at that core, we may have advocates, law enforcement, healthcare providers, prosecutors, but then we recognize that we need this larger response of um, our whole community to really centralize victim safety and offender accountability. So this is a list, it is not completely comprehensive list because it's gonna depend on who in your community can bring something to the table uh, to improve the safety for victims. Um, so your list of who's in your coordinated community response may look like this, may not, uh, but it's a good some good suggestions about where you could start. Um, and I know we have a fair number of people from public health in this training. And I, so I wanted to mention that when you're thinking about the people to bring to the table, that sometimes those people can bring a unique perspective that really helps your team get established and gets the support from other disciplines that you might need. So one of the other hats that I wear is doing um, firearm work around domestic violence with the Domestic Violence Resource Center um, and uh, Firearm and Resource Center. And when working with Seattle, King County on how to surrender firearms from individuals who either have a protective order against them or have a misdemeanor domestic violence conviction, um, Seattle was trying to start a protocol, start a gun violence team there and what really helped them was a statement and the support of public health. Public health came forward and said, firearm uh, violence, particularly firearm violence and domestic violence is an epidemic in our country and we need to look at it that way. And it was their support that helped propel forward to get a million dollar grant to do that firearm surrender work. So, um, you never know where your partners are gonna come from who can really move the work forward. And it may not necessarily be a, a typical criminal justice partner uh, that and, really helps you. And Julie, I wanted just to pop in because I, I we noticed how many people are coming from so many different sort of entry points last, uh, last training, last week. And I just wanted to share a little bit about my experience um, when I was presenting on policy points for the Gender Policy Council, um, to work on ending violence against women, we had a listening session where representatives from every branch of the executive, every agency came so that we could talk to them about what role they have in ending violence against women. And so housing, health and human services, um, different agencies um, that may not necessarily see themselves as the go-to, like say Department of Justice, right? But we were able to talk with them to talk about, here's how we can do work in poverty. Here's how we can provide safe and sustainable housing. Here's how we can work with mental health or substance abuse. Here's how we can work in terms of childcare. So if you don't see somebody or an organization or yourself on just this, this graph right here, I really wanted to share that people were really excited because they realized we really do have a way, a, a way in which you can make a difference to make sure that you're communicating that domestic violence won't be tolerated and that we can really work to prevent and to really reduce harm in a lot of really creative ways. And so I kind of wanted to share my personal story with that as well. This next slide reminds us that even when we get the right people at the table, um, it doesn't always 
guarantee good collaboration. And I think that's why a lot of you are here today is, you know, <laughs> how do we get the good collaboration? I think we all have experiences of temperament, communication styles, turf wars, um, impacting even the strongest of teams. So uh, I love these monkeys because, you know, you all know people like this, you all work with them, those who don't want to speak or hear or see, see the things that are going on. And I like to say they're the folks that who don't want to play well, don't work and play well with others. Um, but just like engineers, when we're building our bridge, anticipate what could corrode that structural material and supports, um, your community response also has to think about corrosion. What really corrodes collaboration? What gets us to the point where we're siloed or we're these monkeys who are not communicating and playing well together? Um, and one of those really major cor corrosive elements that all teams face is assumptions and judgments that we make about the other people that we encounter in doing the work that we do. So here's an example um, of an experience that I had. And so this involves a detective and an advocate. And kind of that idea, the story I tell myself. We all have that running narrative in our head when something is happening or what we are experiencing, hearing, seeing, and the story that we make up about that to fill in the gaps about the things we don't know. So in this case, this involved a sexual assault advocate and an interview with a victim. Um, this particular detective was the kind of uh, detective. He had a big, long handlebar mustache. He wore his gun all the time, even when it was unnecessary. He wore sunglasses even when he was indoors, right? And so this advocate, upon meeting this detective, is telling herself the story of, oh, my gosh, this is a big macho cowboy cop mentality, you know, I, she already had an impression of who she thought he was by his appearance. And during the course of this interview, uh, the detective asked a lot of questions about the victim's bra. He asked about the size of the book, the cup size, the material, was it silky or lacy, the color that it had been. Um, and this was not a brand new victim's advocate. So she'd been to plenty of these interviews and she was really um, feeling like something was very different. And the story she started to tell herself as this interview was being conducted is, you know, here's a victim who's quite young and attractive. He's asking all these kind of overly personal questions about her lingerie and that he's really just doing this to satisfy his own curiosity. Um, maybe he's re-victimizing her. He's being uncomfortable. Frankly, between the way he dresses, the mustache, the sunglasses, the questions he's asking her, this guy's a jerk. This detective is an absolute jerk, right? And so based on what she was seeing and hearing, she had told herself a story about this individual that she had to work. Um, and there will be a part two to this later on. But but I, what I want you to think about is how often we do that. We hear or see some part of something and we tell ourselves a story about the rest of it. Um, or we hear or see something from one individual and we tell ourselves a story about that person's intent or behavior in the action. So what is something that you think a lot of professionals get wrong about your profession um, that makes it harder for you to work together? Is there one thing that you wish other professions knew about either your position or the responsibilities of that position that would make working together easier, that would have them doing less of filling in their own story um, for you? And if you go to Menti, uh, I'm advancing the question right now, so you should be able to participate. <laughs> so the code is, is the 6080-7085. And I think a good example, maybe to help get, if you want to sort of figure out what we're asking, you know, Julie and I would talk about advocates really want prosecutors to do X, Y, and Z. And 
then the problem is that, and, and Julie can certainly tell this, she has a great work story and a training story about this, but not understanding what Julie can or can't do changes how I see her rather than she obviously has a bias against these cases. You know, Julie can come back to me and say, actually, I can't, you know, I can't charge this case or I don't have this right. And I don't know if Julie, you want to share your story now or on another slide. Um, I think it's so I'm gonna, illustrative. I'm going to save it. Sure, I'm going to save it for another slide, but oh, I will sorry, share with you sorry. Why, I, why I chose the image that I did on this mentee. And it's in its part because each of the little men, when they play foosball, right, they have their area to guard and to, to be in charge of moving the ball when it gets into their area. But they're also very limited. They can go forward and back and they can go sideways, but they can't go diagonal and they can't switch lanes. They can't jump onto a different bar, right? They're pretty much struck, stuck in just their two ways of movement. And I think sometimes we look at other professions and we forget that they're bound by uh, statutory regulation, by the job duties, by what their boss sets as protocol. And we think that they have the ability to move in ways that they really don't. So I think foosball really demonstrates that for us. So thank you for all of you who are participating. Um, I see lots of great answers, how vital we are. Um, I don't solve complex problems in one day, amen. Uh, the <laughs> the critical importance of cultural competency. There are legal limits to what police prosecutors, judges, and probation can do. Absolutely, we're all bound by our statutory mandates. Uh, how much we rely on others doing their work thoroughly. See, I don't know why this isn't scrolling. Maybe those are all the answers. <laughs> Um, hey, deadlines mandated by the federal government. Absolutely. I don't have all the answers. And I was really hoping someone here would have all the answers. <laughs> oh, interesting. Uh, talking about I'm there to label their child, which brings shame to the family. Wow. That's really powerful. We're going to talk a lot about shame today. And, yes, and we are. A very powerful emotion that that impacts a lot of us, right? Mm -hmm. That people have to follow laws or rules that that would constrain what you can or can't do. Something that I think we bump up against frequently in this line of work. That it's more than just sitting and looking at the computer all day. I love that. <laughs> Scrolling through these, I'm hoping you all get an opportunity to um, read a lot of them because these are really powerful. I'd like them to know how many things I juggle. Um, attorneys are not trying to impede progress when we point out the liabilities of certain actions. We are trying to make sure everyone understands the risks and trying to protect people's rights. Absolutely, attorneys, we get a we get a bad rap for being Debbie Downers, right? Because we're always thinking about the liabilities and the risks and the harms um, inherent in every decision. Don't forget that folks have to follow HIP, right? Com I saw another comment on confidentiality. Absolutely, even though we work collaboratively. Um, that confidentiality can be a real challenge, which is why we encourage part of your original setup documents to be confidentiality agreements. Self-care matters in this work. Yes, it does. There's that magic wand again. You see how much would be changed if we just had magic wands? <laughs> Oh, and there's one about feedback. Now I'm very excited to see that because we have a nice little section on feedback later on. Absolutely. Again, These are thank, great. You for, thank you all for participating. And I think um, the fact that you all had so many answers to share there really speaks to the fact that 
we aren't as clear and as explicit with each other as we need to be to understand everybody's role, everybody's expectations, and everybody's job duties. So uh, again, thank you for sharing all of that. So as we move on from people to the culture of your working group, whatever, whether that's a formal or tight-knit group or whether we're talking about larger relationships, I'm going to bring back the tired but true image of the iceberg. And the reason is just because it's really so applicable. So when we think about our organizational culture, right, that sort of work culture, there's that top part um, that's pretty visible, that's pretty explicit, right? Which is we might talk about strategy. We might talk about what our shared values are. We might have some structures or some processes in place. But really the thing about icebergs is what's beneath the surface, right? In, in nature, actually, um, part of the reason is that the differences between the pure ice and the seawater is so vast, so different that that's why we only see about 10 to 12% of an entire iceberg above the waterline. And it's really the same for culture. We think about those things that we really don't see explicitly, but that are just as strong of an influence on the culture and the decisions and the actions or inactions that we take and how we work with each other. And these are things like perceptions, beliefs, what are the unspoken norms of a, of a culture? You know, and so example, you might think about law enforcement or criminal justice culture versus perhaps social work or perhaps systems-based versus community-based. But when you take just that one iceberg and then you start to do a coordinated community response, then you're looking at multiple icebergs, right? Think about how all of these layer one on top of another. And so it's really critical to take a step back and think about what culture, what organizational culture are you coming from when you come to the work of a CCR? And what kind of culture do you want to have as your team? It should be something that you're really intentional about. And you have to think, just like we talked about the design, I mean, excuse me, the, um, the support elements that might go into a bridge, you're looking to pick these supports that are not going to corrode as easily or not break down or wear out. And when we talk about teamwork, one of the most corrosive things that any team can really have is having a culture of blame. And we thought that nobody uh, explains that really better than Brene Brown. So we're going to show you a nice little clip from her. How many of you are blamers? How many of you, when something goes wrong, the first thing you want to know is whose fault it is? Hi, my name is Brene. I am a blamer. <laughs> Let me just tell you this quick story. So this is a couple years ago when I first realized the magnitude to which I blame. I'm in my house. I have on white slacks and a pink sweater set, and I'm drinking a cup of coffee in my kitchen. It's a full cup of coffee. I drop it on the tile floor. It goes into a million pieces, splashes up all over me. And the first, I mean, a millisecond after it hit the floor, right out of my mouth is this, damn you, Steve. <laughs> Who's my husband? Because let me tell you how fast this works for me. So Steve plays water polo with a group of friends. And the night before he went to go play water polo. And I said, hey, make sure you come back at 10 because you know, I can never fall asleep into your home. And he got back like at 1030. And so I went to bed a little bit later than I thought. Ergo, my second cup of coffee that I probably would not be having had he come home when we discussed. Therefore, and so the rest of that story is I'm cleaning up um, the kitchen. Steve calls, caller ID. I'm like, hey. He's like, hey, what's going on, babe? <laughs> what's going on? Um, <laughs> So I'll tell you exactly what's going on. I'm cleaning up the coffee that spilled all, like dial tone. Because he knows. How many of you go to that place when something bad happens, the first thing you want to know is whose fault is it? I'd rather it be my fault than no one's fault. Because why? Why? Because it gives us some semblance of control. But here, if you enjoy blaming, this is where you should stick your fingers in your ear and do the na-na-na-na thing because I'm getting ready to ruin it for you. 
Because here's what we know from the research. Blame is simply the discharging of discomfort and pain. It has an inverse relationship with accountability. Accountability, by definition, is a vulnerable process. It means me calling you and saying, hey, my feelings were really hurt about this, and talking. It's not blaming. Blaming is simply a way that we discharge anger. People who blame a lot seldom have the tenacity and grit to actually hold people accountable because we expend all of our energy raging for 15 seconds and figuring out whose fault something is. And blaming is very corrosive in relationships, and it's one of the reasons we miss our opportunities for empathy. Because when something happens and we're hearing a story, we're not really listening. We're in the place where I was, making the connections as quickly as we can about whose fault something was. Well, I saw in the chat, everybody was loving Brene Brown. Uh, we have to give a shout out. She's from Austin. She's from Texas. Uh, she teaches here in Austin. So I, I thank you for that feedback. I'm glad you guys enjoyed. And so it's so important to think about, you know, as a team, particularly working in the work that we do, right? We are passionate because we know that people's lives, that their suffering is on the line. So there's a lot of emotion. There's a lot of pain as Brene highlighted, in our work. And as those who are working either directly or even at that macro policy level, we feel that. And that can really come out into our conversations and our work. And so let's think about why we might blame in our work beyond what, what she highlighted. Um, number one, it's an excellent defense mechanism. It helps you really preserve your sense of self-esteem, right? You don't have to look at yourself, your own flaws. Um, it's a tool that we can often use when uh, we're trying to punish someone for a fault. And that might come from that anger and pain of knowing that a person or a system let a survivor down or, or put her in jeopardy. Um, sometimes we're not comfortable facing the larger roots, the real reasons behind the problems like colonialism, racism, misogyny, and it can just be easier to blame an individual. And so then we think, well, what's so bad about that, right? At the end of the day, we're talking about you know, holding somebody accountable. What's wrong with saying, hey, you know, you really screwed up on that case or, or you know, you're, you're really messing up these meetings. And the problem um, is that it's really, really corrosive and it's not really going to get you where you want to be. Blame spawns three cycles of self-destruction on any kind of team, whether this is an inter-office team, a multidisciplinary team, or a larger CCR. And the first thing blame does is it takes you through a cycle of inaction. It gets you trapped, right? Because if it's not safe to make mistakes, if we're looking at somebody to rage at, then the people that are on the receiving end of that are going to stop taking initiative. They're going to stop bringing problems to the table. They're not going to surface those. They're also not really going to take initiative, right? They're just going to be wait to do sort of as they're told. And then this is in turn going to frustrate, say, the head of that CCR. The second component really is that fear of being blamed. Once you have some folks on the team where it's just pointing fingers and pointing out fault and mistakes, then people are scared. That's not comfortable. No one wants to get personally called out and blamed for things. So systems, organizations, agencies are gonna end up hiding their mistakes. You're not gonna have a sense of whether or not a system or an agency or an office is really working well. You're gonna have a false sense of reality because you're covering up. Nobody's learning from mistakes. Nobody feels safe being vulnerable enough to say, gosh, you know what? In that case, X, Y, and Z didn't work well. What could I do better next time? And then you end up making more mistakes because when you don't learn from them, then you don't do things differently the next time. And the third cycle that the fear of blame can cause on a team is this cycle of infighting. Well, now folks are getting defensive, right? You're getting defensive. You're going to start to deflect blame. You're going to start pointing fingers at each other. Then nobody's going to cooperate. And in our first session, we talked about how cooperation is so important. We looked at those factors of collaboration. And when we're talking about when resources, time, and energy is short, and the complexity of the multiple systems and agencies and helping professionals, 
that get involved with survivors, when they're not collaborating and they're not cooperating, then the problems just pile up both for survivors and their families and the agencies. And I think a great way to think about this is, you know, either if you're house training a puppy or if you've got like a toddler, right, or a small child, when we shame and blame them, then they just sneak off and do the same behaviors, right? It's sneaking and hiding. When we move to a culture of accountability, we can make sure that we surface those problems and we actually deal with them and move forward. And so probably your next question is great. How do we do that? <laughs> now, now that we know, you know what we should do, how, what's the answer? And the answer is a culture of accountability. The difference in these two organizational cultures um, or mindsets really is three key areas. One is in what you believe, what is the individual as well as the team focused on, and then the results that you're going to get. And so as you look over this table, I hope you maybe think about what both your, your direct day-to-day -day culture is like and where you're coming from, as well as what kind of culture you, you'd wanna see on a coordinated community response. But in a culture of blame, people are seen as problems, their headaches, mistakes or career ending, or you don't want, nobody wants to admit that they've done something that might have um, harmed a survivor or their family or not, not helped them get the support, safety, and justice that they need. Whereas a culture of accountability, people are problem solvers. We all make mistakes. We can learn from those. And problems are opportunities to do things better. Cultures of blame, you're focused on, like Brene, who's wrong, right? Your team is damn you, Erica. It's someone else's fault. And it's about people. It's personalized. It's individuals. It's really looking backwards and it's assigning punishment. I think we might have lost Erica. Are you with us? Um, yeah, shucks, I think she's frozen. Let me try to, I'll try to chat her and see if she can maybe okay. restart. I will just pick up here uh, with where she left off and keep moving. So um, talking about the culture of accountability, we're really focused on what is wrong. What is the core problem? Um, we look at finding to figure out what is wrong and how it can be solved. Um, the culture of blame results in, as I shared in that sort of story before about the officer and the advocate making assumptions about people and really about their intentions, that, that maybe they were intending something negative. Um, it can lead to hiding the problems rather than surfacing them and addressing them. Distrust, turf wars between agencies, um, and those people being uh, very risk adverse. On the, on the flip side of that, the culture of accountability is going to result in, um, you know, a very high functioning team where you're able to delegate decision making authority because there's a high level of trust between all members within that team. And we trust that they're all there for the right reasons to do the right thing. Um, we are more innovative. We take more risks in a counter of, a cult of accountability because there isn't this negative blame and shame for failure, for making mistakes. Um, so Julie, are, Julie won't back. blame me for, <laughs> she won't say to me, Erica, that was so unprofessional what you did. Julie will say to me, wow, in that training, we had some internet problems. What can we do in the future to solve those? <laughs> so again, I thank you all for your patience. <laughs> um, but as I Julie was- up and finished, they, but is there anything else you want to add about you. that? No, not at all. I just think that you can really see the difference between the two cultures and what the outcomes are. And then what we'd like to share with you next is how do you create that culture of accountability on your CCR? One of the ways that you can create this culture of accountability is trying to build consensus through the process of inquiry. So when I use the word inquiry, I really define it to mean the practice of seeking what is both true and useful. So 
when we talk about that, um, that incident with the advocate and the officer that I described earlier, after she had come to the point where the advocate had decided that this officer was just a jerk, um, she asked him to go out into the hall with her <laughs> and have a discussion about the, the way this interview was going. And she had two choices when she got to the hall. One would be a blaming and shaming and one would be accountability. The blaming and shaming would look like, I can't believe you're doing this. I can't believe you're asking about her, her clothing in that way. You are re-victimizing this poor girl who's just been raped, right? The other avenue would be through inquiry to ask some good answerable questions about what was happening. And the advocate in this situation chose the inquiry route and asked, you know, I've been to a lot of these interviews before. This one feels different to me. And in part, it's because of your many, many questions about this young woman's bra. Is there a basis for this? And the officer said, yeah, in fact, there is. We recovered a bra from the crime scene and we're hoping that she can identify it as hers without sharing with her what it looks like or um, what it, you know, what it's made of or anything like that. And so he was trying to corroborate a very specific piece of his case, but it was coming off as voyeurism or something negative towards this victim. And by choosing the path of inquiry, that advocate actually, you know, maintained that relationship with that officer instead of putting them at odds by blaming and shaming him. When it turns out that what he was doing, if she understood it, um, was actually really what he needed to be doing. So when you're trying to focus on what is both true and useful, you can turn judgment into curiosity. So when we find ourselves judging or making an assumption that detective is a jerk, um, like the advocate in my story, uh, you have to turn that into a question. Instead of assuming a bad intent, ask a question about the behavior that you're concerned about. What is the context? Why is this interview different than all the past interviews I've been to? Why is this person making this choice right now? Another thing you can do when you are focused on inquiry is if you are in a disagreement with a team member, you can turn it into a shared exploration. So find a question that you can try to answer together that gets into whatever it is you're disagreeing about. Um, your conflict won't necessarily go away. The disagreement might still remain but it often sort of recedes into the background while you get engaged in this shared exploration of trying to solve the question that you've posed. Turning defensiveness into self-reflection, you know, when you find yourself getting defensive or even defensive on someone else's behalf as the advocate was, you have to stop and say, why am I feeling this way? Why is this individual triggering me? What about this situation is making me so defensive? So when we can self-reflect on why we might be reacting to another person in a particular way, that really helps us walk on that path of what is both true and useful. And then finally, turn those assumptions into questions. It truly is the key to learning. So the next time you find yourself in a disagreement or in a position of making an assumption or a judgment about a situation, sit down, take out that yellow notepad and try to act try to come up with three real and answerable questions about that situation aside from the judgment that, you, that you're making. A handout that uh, came out to you for this training is um, this choice. It's, one, it's, it's another tool that you can use in your work as either an individual or on a team or a group that really will help shift efforts away from that culture of judgment, shame and blame to one of inquiry and accountability. So this one is um, a blueprint for how to implement some of these keystones and shift your team to a culture of inquiry and accountability. And so when you look at the start, you have anything that impacts you in that moment, our little blue person there, thoughts, feelings, circumstances, something that you're hearing, experiencing, and you can choose the learner mindset, which is the top route, the teal colored route, right? 
where you're asking questions, you're engaging in inquiry, what happened? Um, what assumptions am I making about what happened? What are What is the other person thinking, feeling, and wanting? Um, versus the purple lower route, the judger mindset, which is something that I experience, think, feel, and I immediately go to, as Brene said, whose fault is it? And can end you up kind of in that judger pit where we're just negatively um, caught in this cycle of blaming and shaming. And it's it's really a, a lose-lose situation for our relationships and for our teams. The last critical support we'd like to cover today are really good interpersonal skills, which you can use in all kinds of areas in your life. But in particular, CCRs really can't exist or function without trust and healthy relationships between partners. So um, I can't remember if we talked about, Erica, can you help me? Did we already talk about the start team splintering? We did. In our in our previous training, we shared how our Austin sexual assault response team splintered into two, which reminds me of the arch enemies. Uh, we warned you about our bad jokes, by the way. So, you know, when we talked about that story last week of the SART team splintering into two fractions, that's really a, a perfect example um, that we don't really live or work in bubbles. And so one way that we can really strengthen our relationships and one of the skills that we're going to focus on a lot today is communication. So just like our design process, clarity in communication is really critical to preventing corrosion. Um, we have to be, as we talked about last week, uh, explicit in our communication. Um, so this sounds really good in theory, and, and another Brene Brown quote who likes to say communication should be clear, and that clear is kind and unclear is unkind. Um, but what does it really look like in practice? How we all have that one person in our lives, I think, that we might refer to as brutally honest. I have that person that I like to take shopping with me, the, the brutally honest person who will be like, no, that is not for you. <laughs> you should not wear yellow. Um, but what we need to do in teams is get to the point where we can have the honest part without the brutal part. How can we balance candor with respect and the need for improvement and ensure that we're not corroding trust and delving back into the blame game? Erica? I have my... I have my IT people literally on this. I'm texting them uh, downstairs. Uh, I am with you. And again, thank you again for your patience. Um, so Julie, I don't know if you started on this slide yet or not. I can. We did not. We did. Well, then I'll be happy to take this. So barriers from communication besides internet connection. Um, when we think about what gets in the way of really, really good communication, there's really five kind of big pockets. One is judging. You know, judging refers back to that curious, that learner mindset or approaching with inquiry versus approaching with um, judgment or assumptions or bias. And so it's thinking about, you know, are we criticizing? Are we blaming? Are we kind of diagnosing or labeling others? And I don't mean diagnosing with mental health, right? But I, I mean, do we call them a problem, right? Are they, oh, it's her. Oh, it's that person again. Uh, another thing is our attention. When we don't pay full attention, that's a real barrier to communication. Are we preoccupied? Are we multitasking? You know, are we on our phones and mm -hmm, yeah, mm -hmm. are we distracted? And that's really important when we're talking a about really specific, serious cases and issues, but just one on one when you don't feel heard or listened to or important, then that trust breaks down. It starts to corrode. A third barrier is technical language or jargon. On coordinated community response teams, we all come from different backgrounds, lenses, professions, educational backgrounds. And so, you know, I laugh because sometimes when I'm talking with someone, it feels like an alphabet soup, right? And so that can be a real barrier because not only then do you not understand what we're all saying, but it's also a way to keep barriers between ourselves. We become an us versus them and, and not a we. 
Um, another barrier um, is giving the, the unwanted solutions or opinions or advice. We don't mean to, but I call this when you get should on, <laughs> and I warned you about explicitness, um, you know, you should do this, you should have done that. And a last barrier is really um, missing or not acknowledging the concerns of others, not really hearing them. You know, I had a, I come from North Carolina and I had an aunt who said, darling, you got two ears and one mouth for a reason. And so we don't actively hear either what the person is saying or what they're really trying to say. But the good news is, is you can balance that out, right? So now that you sort of know what are some barriers these are the ways to build better communication with your team members and honestly really with anyone the first skill that you can really start to build is active listening again there's that listen twice as much as you speak keep a mindset of curiosity and try to refrain from interrupting let them finish what they need to say we often find ourselves talking over each other's we just want to get our point out so bad but slow that down Another technique that you can use are just your nonverbal behaviors. And I think you all have heard this a lot before, right? But if you're sitting there with your arms crossed or you're checking your watch or you're looking at it, it's not receptive and it shuts the other person down. And when we shut down people, we don't get information that we need. So nod your head, smile, make little, mm -hmm, okay. Be open, receptive, keep eye contact. Another technique is ask open-ended questions and your communications. It shows your interest really as well as it helps you get clarity. So yes or no, black or white answers don't help you dig deep. And that's really important when you are getting in some of those difficult tense situations about how a particular system is doing or how a particular office or person is doing. Another effective tool is to use clear and concise language. It just goes back to that Brene Brown quote and what Julie had said, clear is kind. Clarify, summarize, or paraphrase. I come from a social work background, and so it was absolutely ingrained in us um, for counseling skills would be to say, so if I'm hearing you correctly, blah, blah, blah. But again, it might sound like a silly or a formal thing to do, but it reduces the chances of misunderstanding. And it also ensures that you get the info you need to make decisions or form opinions and take action. And it lets the other person know that you are tuned into them, you are listening. Be empathetic. Again, that just goes back to we all have a basic need to be heard and acknowledged. And so when we're coming from different perspectives, perhaps it's law enforcement or criminal justice versus social work or advocacy or mental health, or when we're coming from a systems-based perspective versus a community-based or a grassroots perspective, we need to know, and I've heard Dr. Brown, thank you very much. Yes, Dr. Brene Brown. Um, but we need to make sure that we're all giving room that we acknowledge and understand where the other person is coming from because that really is gonna de-escalate the tension when you get into some of those heated conversations and discussions. Provide feedback. We're gonna go over this a little bit more in a minute, but understand that while feedback's a necessary component of professional accountability and growth, giving or receiving it puts us in a place of vulnerability, right? And that can be uncomfortable. That can be really difficult. And last is in terms of communications, when you develop trust and rapport, it really means doing what you say you will, right? Your actions have to match your words. Be consistent, be honest, communicate with integrity, and that trust is naturally going to build and strengthen over time. So even when we have good communication skills and practicing them, there are still those those uh, conversations that we know are going to be uncomfortable. So uh, you may get tired of hearing her name, but Brene Brown in her book, Dare to Lead, addressed what needs to change for leaders to be more successful in a complex kind of rapidly changing environment. Um, and the answer was, we need braver leaders and more courageous cultures. 
And of the 10 behaviors that leaders ranked as the greatest barriers to courage and greatest concern was avoiding tough conversations, including honest, productive feedback. And in her research with uh, supporting companies, Brene has found that the consequences of avoiding the tough conversations or kind of tapping out of a difficult rumble as soon as it gets uncomfortable to you um, include things like diminishing trust and engagement, uh, increasing problematic behavior, including passive aggressive behavior, talking behind people's backs, um, pervasive back channel communication, or, or what's referred to as the meeting that happened after the meeting, um, gossip, and the dirty yes, that yes, when I will say yes to your face, but then go behind your back and not do what I had said that I had done. It can also decrease performance due to a lack of clarity and shared purpose. So, when we, uh, one of the most important uncomfortable conversations that you can have sometimes uh, relates to the mentee that we had you fill out, which is what do you want other professionals to know about your position or responsibility? So a little side story about my experience doing this activity was um, when, we, when we tried to start a children's um, center in Rochester for the investigation of child sexual and physical abuse, things were going very badly. Um, law enforcement was blaming child protection, child protection was blaming law enforcement, and the medical community was very angry. We had kids slipping through the cracks. Um, there was lots of blame and shame and finger pointing going on. And at the point that I got involved and decided that we should have a big meeting to talk about how we could work collaboratively and move this forward was the day that a medical emergency report came across my desk as a prosecutor as part of a file. But the doctor had said in the notes in the file, this is the third time I've reported this child to Child Protective Services. If somebody doesn't do something, the next time I see this boy, he'll be in a pine box. Um, and even to say that statement to you today brings back, I have goosebumps saying it aloud. It brings back for me the moment of reading that and how horrible that felt to feel like our system was failing that badly. So the decision was made to move forward in a multidisciplinary fashion for the investigation, trying to do cooperative investigations between law enforcement and child protection, involving the prosecutor, involving the medical staff, um, and ultimately building a children's advocacy center um, in conjunction with the Mayo Clinic. But I will tell you that when we started working as a team, it was bad. Um, the distrust and the shame and blame was off the charts. So we went to get help with our team. We went to a week-long session down in Huntsville, Alabama, which is the home of Children's Advocacy Centers. That's where they were first started. And one activity they had us do is sort of the activity we had you do on Menti, but in our team. So everyone on the team got to go up to a whiteboard and write down what they thought my job as the child abuse prosecutor was. And then when they were all finished, they'd all had their turn, I got to go up with a marker and eraser and say, well, that's not actually my job. That is something only a judge can do, or this is something law enforcement does, or you know, this is beyond my statutory mandate. And by letting each profession have their turn to go up and have everybody else say what they thought their jobs were. What we found is that a lot of the anger and a lot of the frustration within that team was that we had unreasonable and inaccurate expectations about the other person's job. And so by um, figuring that out, by being able to clear up and clarify what our job duties were, what our roles, what our statutory limits were, our cooperation as a team improved tremendously. So that's one activity I encourage you to do, no matter how well your team is functioning, I guarantee you will learn things about each other and your jobs that you did not know. 
Um, but when you have another, when you have an individual or a department where your communication is strained and it's uncomfortable, one of these, some of these questions can also be helpful, right? What is one belief or perception I have about you? What is one thing you don't know about me? And what would make our contact easier? Believe me, if you're feeling that your contact with that individual is strained, they feel it too. And just that question of what would make our working together or our contact easier really just opens that sort of floodgate of, oh, this person really cares and they want to do better and they want our communication to be better. So when we understand each other's positions, um, we have more clear expectations about what people will and can do. Within teams, uh, there will be, even for the most skilled communicators, there will be conflict. And chances are, when you hear that word conflict, you cringe a little bit. And you think of either something horrible that happened in your work setting, or maybe in your personal life, where there was some intense conflict. Um, but getting the most out of the diversity on our teams often means we're going to have contradictory values, perspectives, and opinions. So conflict is not in and, in and of itself bad. Um, conflict can have both positive or negative outcomes, depending just on how that conflict is managed. Poorly managed conflict involves participants, you're going to get tired of this word, blaming and shaming each other. Um, a focus on finger pointing and really just kind of a name calling rather than any problem solving. Poorly managed conflict results in increased stress and anxiety for employees and decreased product productivity. Um, really feelings of just being defeated and demeaned, which is gonna lower an individual and the overall team's morale. And a climate of mistrust, which hinders any advancement in your teamwork or the cooperation that you have to get things done. So just like, you know, a trust bridge or an arch bridge, leaders and teams really need to capitalize on the inherent tensions conflict can bring and use them for the proper outcomes. Because properly managed conflict can help raise and address problems. Properly managed conflict will identify issues um, and solve them. They can energize the work to be most focused on the most important priorities. It's easy in all of our work or on our teams to go down those rabbit holes that aren't really important, but they're going to be a major time. Slot. When we know how to manage conflict, we can focus in on what we need to be working on. Um, it can really help people be real and vulnerable. Um, and motivate them to participate fully in the discussion and in moving your team forward. Um, and it can help people recognize and benefit from their differences, right? We'll have differences of opinion, we'll have differences of values, and how to recognize and value those and not um, a conflict over them. So how, what does good conflict management look like? There are really... Um, Three, you know, there are different ways that people can deal with conflict. So first of all, you can avoid it. And I would, you'd probably agree that a lot of us choose the avoidance path um, fairly often. You just pretend it's not there, you ignore it. But using this approach um, only when it's simply not worth the effort to argue. Um, and avoiding it, I think we all recognize tends to worsen the conflict over time because the conflict doesn't really go away when you avoid it. You're just not making it worse or bringing it to light. You can accommodate the conflict, right? So that's when you just give in to the other person. Um, and sometimes to the extent you have to compromise yourself to do that. So this is an approach you wanna use to conflict pretty sparingly and infrequently. Um, in situations where you know that you will have another more useful approach, maybe in the near future. Um, using this approach a lot can worsen conflict over time. 
And it can cause conflicts within yourself because you always feel like you're giving up to someone else or you're giving up a part of yourself to accommodate someone else. Some people compete with others in conflict. So you work it out to get your way rather than clarifying or addressing the issue. It's just about winning the issue or winning the conflict for someone who is a competitor. Um, and competitors, of course, are going to love the accommodators because accommodators are going to give in and let the competitors win. Um, you want to use this approach when you have very strong conviction about your position. Then we have compromise. And we often think that, you know, maybe that's the absolute best solution to conflict management because it's a mutual give and take. Um, this approach is used when the goal is to get past the issue and just move on together. How do we compromise? Um, in my house, sometimes the compromise over a particular treat is one kid gets to cut it, but the other kid gets to pick the half that they want to have. Um, so that might be the compromise. And then finally, there's collaboration where the focus is on working together. And you want to use this collaborative approach when the goal is to meet as many current needs as possible um, by utilizing some mutual resources. So collaboration can also be used when the goal is to cultivate ownership and commitment of your team. But kind of an example or something to think about the difference between compromising and collaborating is the story of the two chefs. So there are two chefs and they both need an orange to complete their, the recipes they're working on. And there's only one orange left in the kitchen. So they decide to make a compromise about that orange and they cut it in half and they each get half of the orange. And one of the chefs is making a sauce and the sauce required the juice of a full orange and he only had half. So the dish came out okay, but not perfect. And the other chef was trying to bake a cake and it required the rind of, you know, of one orange. Um, and again, he only had half of the rind. So it came out okay, but not perfect um, because they each only had half of the ingredients. And as they completed their dishes, what they realized seeing one chef needing just the rind or the peel and the other needing just the juice, had they actually communicated what they needed and why they needed it, they both could have had their needs met fully for their recipes. One could have had all the juice and one could have had all the rind. And so really, while compromise is a conflict management skill, it's not always the best if you don't communicate clearly um, and explicitly about why you need something and what it is that you need. So again, we want to let you know that one of the resources that we provided ahead of this training is a managing conflict handout um, that you might be able to use in your day-to-day -day work with others and on your CCRs and MDTs. So we know that there's always going to be conflict. We don't live in bubbles. We, um, we, we, we have it with our family. We have it with our friends. And we thought we'd kick off a little segment on how do you really handle conflict? Um, because it doesn't have to be bad, but how do we handle it well? And a big part of that is feedback, right? It's when we need to talk to each other about something that is happening or that's going on. Um, and it can be positive. It can be negative. I think a lot of people dread the infamous feedback. So we thought we'd kick it off with a clip that uh, we'll see if any of you recognize either yourself or someone you work with in this video. Hey, Sherry. Oh, hey, Ted, come on in. Sure. Uh, I know we're all really busy, so I appreciate you coming to talk to me. Oh, of course. Anytime. <laughs> <Yeah>. anytime. <laughs> um, great. So I just wanted to take this time to talk to you yeah. about your communication on our project that we've been working on. Uh, I just... Okay. Uh, okay. All right, Ted. Uh, okay, okay. Uh, 
Red has kind of a hard time receiving feedback. Uh, uh, uh. Ted is just Ted. He doesn't change. Doesn't matter what anyone says to him. He's not the easiest person to work with, but I'm so glad that I am not Don. Ted? I used to give him feedback. I mean, I tried giving him feedback all the time. I, I, I tried being sweeter than pie about it, too. Knock, knock. <laughs> Sherry said you wanted to see me. Oh, uh, yeah. You know, I just wanted to, uh, see how you're doing. Oh, great. <laughs> Can't complain. <laughs> Is there something else? Ah, uh, listen, Ted. Everyone's been complaining about your shrieking. When they give you feedback. Ted! Ted! Please! It's got to stop. I just need you to be... I just need you ah. to be aware. Okay, okay, fine. Please just go. Okay. Let me know if you need anything else, okay? He does an okay job, but he could be so much better. There's a, a wall in front of him, a wall of shrieks. Nothing gets in. I have given up. I'm going to leave him alone from now on. I, I just can't stand all that darn shrieking. How well do I take feedback? <laughs> Let me think. <laughs> I like to think that I'm one of the people who remains open to what others have to say, you know? Some people around here can't take any criticism, and honestly, I'm glad I'm not one of them. <laughs> I mean, if you want to improve your job performance, feedback makes a big difference. <laughs> okay, how'd we do? Uh, yeah, we're all set. Okay, good. Uh, I mean, you did pretty good, I, I guess. No, 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 it's okay, though. It, it would have been better if you'd looked at me instead of... Uh... So, I, uh, I hope that gave you a little chuckle for today. Um, right, and we... Uh, so... Uh, feedback's hard, feedback's difficult. And a really great way to think about um, feedback is like spinach in our teeth. Um, and, and I think we should actually, let me walk this back just for a moment to say that, you know, feedback is an inherent part of being on a coordinated community response team because you are constantly evaluating and addressing what is or isn't promoting victim safety, well-being, offender accountability and further harm prevention, and the message that DV is neither going to be ignored nor tolerated, right? We are always constantly evaluating and addressing those things and how are we doing? And then sometimes it is really interpersonal. It's how are we acting on a team together? And so how we receive or provide feedback can really preserve trust in a relationship. It's one of those support pillars that if it's done well, doesn't have to be horrible. It doesn't have to be a corrosive element. You don't have to resort to screaming because you, you just can't hear anything. And so here's some tips for how you can keep that feedback, that communication clear and kind, like Julie was talking about. So I want you to think about feedback, like spinach in your teeth. So for example, I'm going to give, oh, I don't know, an amazing presentation to some folks in Hawaii. And I get up and I have these points that I really want to get across. And when I go home, I look in the mirror and I see there's a huge chunk of spinach in my teeth. And I immediately go, there's no way that the attendees could have paid attention to my message 
when they're staring at this huge distracting thing. It's distracting from my message. Why didn't Julie tell me that I had spinach in my teeth? Well, there's two reasons why somebody doesn't tell you. You know, one is that um, they feel awkward. It can be embarrassing having to give constructive feedback or something that's not quote unquote praise. And the other reason um, that nobody tells you that there's spinach in your teeth is because if you think about it, how often do we ask, right? So how do we do that? So when you think about spinach in your teeth, I want you to think about what are those behaviors or those things that you do or don't do that maybe make the work harder, that get in the way of doing those three things for a CCR, which is victim safety and well-being, offender accountability, and um, sending that message out to the community that DV is neither going to be ignored nor tolerated. So let's talk about how do we do feedback in a way that doesn't get into one of those blame, uh, blame and shame cycles and get self-destructive. So there's two components um, to feedback, and you can break it down like this. First is the requesting and the receiving. We have to ask sometimes before we, we do what we do. Hey, is there any spinach in my teeth? Now, how do you do that in a work situation? One is just the ask, you know, just asking, hey, I noticed there was some tension after I said X, Y, and Z at a meeting. Julie, is there, you know, is there anything that I could be doing better on this team? Or is there anything that I could be doing differently? Ask in a way that builds trust, that builds openness. Don't ask if you're not ready to hear the response. And also when you ask, ask for advice for improvement, not for a list of your past transgressions. And then the only proper response after you have asked for feedback, after you have checked, if, if there's anything you could be doing better on this team or in your work, the only proper response is thank you. Because um, whether you agree or not with what the feedback is, when you start shooting the messengers, you're gonna stop getting your messages. You're not gonna get data and information that's gonna help you or your team grow. The second part of feedback and the way to do it well so that you don't drive everybody crazy like we saw in the video is providing and discussing feedback. And so we break this part down. If you're the one that's either taking the initiative to give it or you've been asked and now you're, you're having to get into that conversation, one is depersonalize it. For example, if you're seeing a pattern where defendants of color are getting harsher sentences, or you're seeing certain types of perpetrators um, not, not being charged, not getting stiffer sentences, you don't go and you say, you know, Julie, I don't know what your deal is, but you blah, blah, blah. That's blaming and that's personalizing. What you want to do is share your observation, share the specifics of it. Hey, Julie, you know what? I looked over um, all, the, all the numbers from the last uh, quarter at court, and I'm noticing this pattern with these kinds of defendants or these types of perpetrators or these types of victims. I don't know, have you seen the same thing? The second component is approach from a place of inquiry, right? Not that assumption, be a fact finder. Don't be an accuser. Julie, you know, you never take the sexual assault cases that are X, Y, and Z. You approach from inquiry. Hey, Julie, you know what? I've noticed this pattern. I don't know if you've seen the same pattern I have, but you know, what, what do you think's going on there? Approach from inquiry. And the reason that that's important is because Julie may have information for you that somebody else that you're giving that feedback with may have information that you don't know about. And then you can go, okay, oh, thanks. I see that there's more to that situation. Okay, I didn't have that info. Thanks for letting me know that. Now that makes more sense. And last, it's again that same principle of we just say, okay, great, thank you. Because even if you don't agree, right, you're not always going to get to a place of agreement if you need to discuss some feedback issues. But what you can do is at least say, okay, well, this is what I'm seeing and this is what you're saying. How can we move forward? How can we move forward as a team or as two individuals? And let's get back and get focused on the survivor. Then there are just those moments, right? There are just those moments. You're at a team meeting or you're on a one-on-one -on -one and things are just going to get heated, right? The problem with those little moments, we're all human. We, I think you all have seen the Snickers commercial. You know, you get hangry. 
But teams can erode like that Austin SART team we discussed earlier, really with the, you know death by a thousand paper cuts. So I want to talk about a couple of techniques that you can use in your day-to-day, heat of the moment, really tense conflict areas where you can just sort of cool down, take a pause, and that way you're not ruining those relationships on your team. The first one I'm going to talk to you about is the six seconds technique. I know a lot of times we talk about there's no place for emotions in the workplace. And I think even in one of the mentees that Julie did, we saw something in there about I have to act logically and not emotionally. But it's really important to know that emotions are actually incredibly useful because they give us data. They give us data about what's going on in the moment, what's going on with us. Um, and it's, it's really important because when you think about it, emotions are actually peptides. There are these peptides that are produced by the hypothalamus and they're chemicals that are released and they go coursing through our, our bodies and our brains. And what these peptides are doing is seeking out receptor cells. They're looking for either a threat or an opportunity. And think about that when you're, when you think about a verbal altercation or think about somebody just kind of getting in your face and things are getting heated, you actually can feel this process, the physiological symptoms. If you think about it, your face might feel flushed or hot. Uh, you, your heart rate can go up. Your muscles can clench. You can clench up. You can clench up your hands. What you're feeling are those peptides where they cascade down. They find a receptor because your body is reading someone being verbally aggressive or critical of you as a threat. And so your nervous system responds in this way. And these receptors find a key, unlock, find a key, unlock. And we call that the cascade effect. And it takes about six seconds. And so it's not hard to understand why with the physiology of this, why do we erupt in the moment? Why can't we always keep our cool? But it's quick. It's six seconds and it's physical and in the background. The good news is that it only takes about six seconds to interrupt that cascade effect. And when you think about it, when you're in a heated discussion or a hot moment, not much needs a response any sooner than six seconds. And what we know from research and practice that works is if you interrupt your senses for six seconds, you interrupt that cascade. Think of it as an eraser crossing right through and cutting that whole cascade in half. So here are some tips to do when you are just in that moment. Interrupt your senses. So if you can taste something, that means take a drink of cold water, hot tea or coffee, pop a mint, pop in a piece of gum, grab a piece of candy out of the candy dish. If you can't interrupt taste, interrupt sight, disengage and look around the room and in your mind, find three round things, name them. Put your hands, if you need to do touch, on a cold desk, fidget with a pen, even if all you can really do is just deep breathing, where you breathe in for four counts, out for four counts, all of those stop that cascade and you'll be surprised at how you can take a pause and actually disengage and get things sort of back on track a little bit. The second technique that you can use is called Oh, I'm sorry, we have a video. We have another video. We're gonna to try to entertain you today. This next video is gonna talk about how do you manage those emotions a little bit. So again, we're all normal, we're all human. How do we stop and pause in that moment? And the second technique you can use is called fogging. So when you're faced with someone who's just aggressively critical, sounding angry, try fogging because it works a lot like real fog. It softens the edges. It blurs that sharpness. And if you also think about, you know, when you're, when, if you're driving through fog, if you have driven through fog, you may not have it. I don't mean to make an assumption, but you slow down, you take your foot off the gas. And so the way that this technique works is you agree with either a small portion of the criticism that happens to be true you agree with maybe the general principle behind the offending statement, or you agree with any possible truth in that statement. So let's say Julie calls me up and she says, Erica, I cannot believe you didn't get the slides to me today. You are so irresponsible. You're always irresponsible. 
I go back and rather than trying to get into a tit for tat, proving her wrong, what I say to her is, Julie, I hear you. You know what? I understand. It is super frustrating when people don't get things to you on time. That's why I emailed you a few days ago to say, I'm just waiting on Kelsey's stats. And then I can finish that slide for you. And there you can see where I don't have to take complete blame, but I can't agree with a small part of what Julie said. And what typically happens then is Julie takes her foot off the anger break. Oh, I didn't expect Erica to agree with me. I expected her to just start to get into it. And fogging helps keep you on track and getting focused on the work and not getting into a one-on-one -on -one kind of fight. So we're gonna finish up today really talking about doing the work. Um, so we've been talking to you for two Fridays now about building a bridge. Um, and so now we're gonna finish up with how do you use that bridge that you built to do system change, to make the system better for victims and survivors of interpersonal violence. And so as we've been talking about building this bridge for uh, two sessions, you all may have been imagining something different in your mind, right? Some of you may have imagined a simple wooden bridge over a nice little stream, while others may have been imagining something more complex, um, like the picture that's on the screen right now. And I will tell you that the systems that we work in are much more like the picture that's on the screen now. Um, we all work in what is known as a complex adaptive system. And that is a group of semi-autonomous agents. So all of these different departments that we're talking about bringing together who interact in independent ways um, to produce system-wide patterns such that those patterns influence the behavior of the agents. So just like these cars on these many roadways with on-ramps and off-ramps, they are acting independently, but options that they take will impact other independent vehicles and potentially the system as a whole, as if there's a car wreck, it could shut down all of the roadways. So um, I encourage you to think about your CCR as this complex um, multi-roadway bridge. So here's another way to think about complex adaptive systems or another look at it. We consider the, the little shapes on the screen right now to be the different individual actors or even the agencies that we're talking about, the prosecutor's office, public health, the sexual assault nurses, the police department, the advocates. So they're all represented there in a little shape. And um, we know that their individual actions in how they handle cases, how they help victims, can shape the system as a whole. We also know that the system has patterns, protocols, and behaviors that will shape the individual actions. So a good system is going to shape good results and make problematic actors more obvious. A bad system will have the opposite. So if, for instance, your system has a vicious cycle, uh, perhaps a prosecutor who doesn't charge domestic violence cases, turns them down all the time for charges, that individual action impacts law enforcement because guess what? They say, we don't wanna investigate these. We spend so much time and energy and we write the reports and we collect the evidence only to have the prosecutor say no. So the law enforcement stops responding, stops investigating thoroughly. And so in that way, an individual's action, that prosecutor has shaped the entire system. The, the judge doesn't see as many cases, the community as a whole doesn't see people being prosecuted or held accountable for domestic violence. And so in that way, we have a vicious cycle. We can also have a virtuous cycle, right? So maybe it's not part of the protocol, but the investigators in the domestic violence unit routinely collaborate with the prosecutor early in cases, try to work together to make sure they're collecting the right evidence. Other investigators and other prosecutors start to adopt that practice too. And it actually becomes sort of de facto protocol, even though it's not written policy and becomes a 
virtuous cycle within our system. So really what we have to be about when we talk about trying to change the system, trying to do this work as a CCR is that we have to shift the patterns. We have to make sure that the patterns that are going through our system, either driven by individuals or by the system, are the virtuous kind of cycle and not the vicious kind of cycle. Um, so what patterns are we looking for in our cycle, right? So one pattern that you might recognize um, is uh, that a particular investigative unit isn't focused on victims or isn't providing them with advocacy or the judicial system isn't really holding it counter as offendable. So we look to identify these patterns and how they might be changed to be more victim-centered, focused on safety for the victim and holding counter, uh, offenders accountable in our communities. So there are three, these are pie pieces, three stool legs, whatever you wanna say to doing system change in any system that you are working in. Um, the first one would be learning and teaching. And that's also training. That's what we're doing here today. So we learn and we teach on new topics, on best practices, on new protocols. The next one would be intending and shaping, which is we write policy and protocol that is up to date, it's current, it's um, clear, it's written and it's up to date. And then finally, we have to do checking and looking, which is also oversight and audit. How do we know if our training is effective? Or how do we know if the policy that may be written in best practices form is actually being followed and implemented? And how do we know if implemented that it's having the desired effect that we put into place? We need all three pieces of this circle to make that work. And the reality is you can get into system change at any point. So when you survey your community for your CCR to see what services are available and what's already going on, you may say, the first thing we learned is our policy is really lacking. It, it was written back in the 1980s. Nobody's updated it. It's not reflective of what we know about intimate partner violence. So we're going to rewrite our policy. Well, once you rewrite the policy, you're going to have to train on it. If you have a new policy and you want someone to follow it, you're going to have to train on it. So training might follow policy writing. And then that would be ultimately followed by oversight and audit. Are our supervisors in departments ensuring that this new policy is being followed on a day-to-day -day basis? And are we doing semi-annual or annual audits to see that the new policy that we wrote is actually having the impact we wanted it to have? But maybe you decide that what's lacking in your community is training and you want to start there. Or maybe you want to start with that big audit just to truly see what's going on. You can start system change anywhere, but all three pieces have to be a part of all of your efforts. So here's an example from a sexual assault um, multidisciplinary team that I worked on. So one of the things we felt was very often sexual violence investigations get very focused on the victim. What were they wearing? Where were they? Why were they out at that time alone? And we wanted to turn that focus back on to suspects. And one way to do that would be to have a forensic exam for the suspect. Because just like you might do a forensic exam of a victim to try and find the suspect's DNA, the victim's DNA on the suspect is just as useful for proving your case. So we had to write a policy and protocol about that. Who would conduct the forensic exams? Where would they be conducted? We can't have them at the same emergency room where our victim is currently being cared for. Um, what is the time frame in which it's reasonable to conduct that kind of exam? So we wrote the policy and protocol covering all the who, what, when, where, and how that was gonna happen. And then we had to train each of our disciplines and we relied on the SART team members. So I was a SART team member. I had to go back and train all the other prosecutors on what this new policy and protocol was for getting a forensic exam process. And then after that had been implemented as a policy in all the departments and trained on, we later had oversight or audit where we would on a case level, 
have supervisors making sure that investigators were doing forensic exams of suspects when they were warranted on a system level to see if that was changing the outcomes in cases, making sexual assault cases more chargeable and more winnable at trial. And then what did we learn from that? Was that a successful system change that we had done? Um, and so really helping you shift from that culture of blame to one of accountability and closing that justice gap for survivors by focusing on the offender. When we talk about tracking and monitoring, um, I think those used words are used in a lot of different contexts and a lot of different disciplines, but it, tracking is really the process of examining the strengths and weaknesses that are in the system response um, through monitoring the police, dispatchers, prosecution, probation, judges, and others in the system to assess, assess whether or not they're really holding offenders accountable. So an example of tracking might be that you're looking to determine if a problem exists. So you want to know, does a downward plea impact recidivism? Do defendants who receive a plea deal ultimately come back on new charges of violence? And you would pull the data on that and see if there's any truth to that. Does that play out? Monitoring would be used to establish if the policies and procedures and protocols um, are improving over time. So we put it in our policy that law enforcement should be asking risk questions to victims of intimate partner violence. And so we're checking and monitoring to see if they are in fact follow, following that protocol. So there are lots of methods and tracking that a CCR could use. Um, one would be focus groups. So bringing together and interviewing groups of survivors about their experience in the system, or perhaps a group from a particular agency about their experience working with their agency or within their agency or with another agency. You could, um, as a team, you could read reports or case files. We want that kind of tracking to be, or monitoring to be done by supervisors regularly to ensure that everyone's following best practices and policies. Um, but it also can be done after a case is completely closed, more as a case review to see what can be learned from closed files about the process. Criminal, uh, reviewing criminal justice databases or specialized domestic violence databases is huge. My domestic violence team, when I was prosecuting, our um, domestic violence shelter did this. They pulled every police report uh, that indicated it was intimate partner violence involved, and they pulled the data. And we met quarterly at lunchtime to go over that data. They put together a nice uh, PowerPoint, but we would see um, you know, they collected data about victim characteristics, the kind of violence that was experienced, what law enforcement's response was, were they providing interpreters when necessary, were they offering victims advocacy, what happened, was the offender arrested, um, was he held in jail on bond, what was the outcome in the case, was there a plea deal, was it dismissed, was there a conviction at trial, and by looking at these large um, bits of data, it's so helpful to people within the group because as a prosecutor, as a police officer, as an advocate, you're taking on cases one at a time, day by day, and it's harder to see those huge trends that you can get from reviewing files on a quarterly basis, a yearly basis. Um, there's also observation can be a huge method of tracking and monitoring, things like ride-alongs with law enforcement. Court Watch has been a powerful tool for elder abuse, um, issues around uh, domestic violence and firearms. We're starting to use Court Watch as well to see if judges are ordering firearms surrendered in these cases and if they're doing a method of compliance to make sure that we're actually taking those guns away from batterers. So you can use um, Court Watch to collect data again to see how well the system is working for victims. So what does all that tracking and monitoring do? Um, as I mentioned, it's going to provide data to system advocates and system professionals, anyone who's participating in your CCR, and they'll be able to see those trends. Is domestic violence in our community on the rise? Is it decreasing? Does the adding of advocacy at the scene 
um, help victims stay in the process through the prosecution. All kinds of trends that you can watch when you are collecting the data. It will help you identify system gaps. Are there um, uh, services that are missing? Where are we not meeting the needs of victims and survivors? It will help you determine if there's adherence to a new policy or protocol. It's really not enough just to pass a new policy or protocol and just sit back and hope that people are going to do it and that we're going to see an improvement in our system. We have to know that it's actually being um, followed. It can really be a service to your partner agencies within the CCR. Um, for instance, reviewing law enforcement files, advocacy could find out that there are a lot more victims who are reporting to law enforcement than are actually seeking advocacy services or vice versa. And we can figure out where that disconnect is coming from. And then finally, it really improves advocacy for survivors. The more we look at the data, the more we look at the trends, the more we can improve the system, which is ultimately the goal to improve the system, to keep victims safer, and to decrease intimate partner violence in our community. So with that, and I know we ran just a little bit over, but I think we do still have 20 minutes or so allotted um, for questions. You um, can continue to use the chat. I know some of you have. I will also throw the Menti back up. That will also allow you to type in questions if you have any. Um, and we'd be happy to answer them. Thanks, Erica and Julie. What a great presentation that was. A good wrap up. And I love the videos. I'm a big fan of Inside Out. So anything that <laughs> I just love that movie so much. I think it's so underrated. Um, but let me see. Yeah, let me, if folks have any questions, please feel free to utilize the chat box or the Q&A boxes on the bottom of your screen. Um, we've got a couple from the team that I just wanted to throw, uh, throw your folks' way. Regarding using inquiry instead of judgment, would it be helpful to set aside some discussion about possible issues on a regular basis, or is it better to address it when some as, as it comes up? Dr. What did you, what, I'm so sorry, could you repeat that? I think I just caught just part of the question, sorry. Uh, regarding using inquiry instead of judgment, would you would it be helpful to set time aside for discussion about possible issues that occur on a regular basis, or better to address it as things come up? One example that I give sometimes about this, I think it's really important to set set aside time. Uh, one of the teams that I was a part of, uh, sexual assault response team we actually had a policy that when you had an issue with another department, um, so here's an example I use. For instance, I got a sexual assault report um, and it was terrible, right? It was just lacking in data, it was terrible. And um, come to find out that the victim's first language was not English and the officer had not offered her an interpreter uh, to get a, an accurate report. And so I know this is an issue, and on my team, I make contact with the law enforcement representative on my multidisciplinary team. And I say, here's an issue I want to discuss at our next meeting. Here's the report. Here's what happened. An interpreter wasn't used. Okay. So what that allows by that, it, that contact outside of the meeting, that allowed law enforcement to go back and see, was this just an individual error where this was a new officer who didn't know about interpreters or the language line or what was available to him? Or, you know, is it a larger sort of systemic problem where we need to talk to all in law enforcement? So by the time we bring it to the table, there is no judgment. There's no, it's already been addressed. And so law enforcement can say, hey, we re-interviewed that victim with an interpreter. We have a better report. And we realize that we have a lot of officers who are new on the force and they just didn't get enough training about the language line. And so we were hoping the MDT could help us do a little 10 minute training at roll call to, to make sure they know what's available in terms of interpretation. And so I think that setting aside time in a meeting and developing a protocol for how you're going to handle issues that come up, instead of me just throwing law enforcement under the table, you know, um, at the meeting and like they did this terrible thing, we've already met privately, talked about it. They've been able to deal with it on their end. I've been able to deal with it on my end. And it just takes away a lot of that judgment and blaming and shaming. So I definitely think 
have a time set aside and a policy for how to do it. And I would add on to that, that it should be actually part of, depending on what you're doing, it can be part of your process like we described earlier. So for example, when I led domestic violence fatality review, that's all we're doing, right? We are setting aside that time to look at one case and find the gaps of what went wrong. What's important is that when you set aside time, it's that language that I'll go back to with the culture of accountability. So you might have in your welcome handbook or you might have a process and the process is gonna be what? Make sure that your language, right? Reflects non-personalization. What went wrong or what happened or what's not working? And I would make it the what, and then I would also make it forward, right? Not looking backwards at, sometimes you have to evaluate, you have to look at those cases like Julie talked about when you're auditing or looking at at patterns backwards, but structuring that in the process as part of it and making sure it's what didn't work right or what could we do better next time, that will help depersonalize and keep, I think, emotions at bay when you do it as part of a, a meeting or a group of people. Okay, thank you for those answers. Um, how do you work with people who take a lot of room in meetings and, you know, and to ensure that everyone has room to speak while not rushing, rushing people? Any suggestions, any strategies? Facilitator, 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 facilitator. And that can be tricky when we're getting into power dynamics. If you want to have co-leaders or you don't want to have necessarily the top down, you know, but having a designated, I would say in meetings, having a facilitator who has facilitation skills. That I think is an incredible way to have someone and that way their role is clear. Everybody knows what their role is. It's not personal. And facilitators have those natural skills. It's how to call on people, how to say, thanks, Jim, so much. You know, you have shared so many good ideas, you know, who we haven't heard from, blah, blah, blah. But having a person whose role it is, again, that depersonalizes it, but everybody knows it's going to be coming. So that's just one technique and one avenue. I don't know if Julie has something she might want to add. Uh, Yeah, I just took this off screen share. So I think um, nobody was typing in questions. So I thought, you know, sometimes you like to see people's face. I don't have anything to add to that. I think that, you know, that's the answer. The person in charge of the meeting has to make that happen. Thank you. How, how can team members address blaming when it come, starts to come up in a meeting? I think part of it, it, it is, is modeling the language again. Um, if it's a one-on-one, it, you know, if, if it's happening, you know, it's difficult to call somebody out. So I, I do think you should be careful where you don't go, hey, Jim, that's not appropriate. It, it's, again, having that facilitator to say, I know that we, it's really interrupting the conversation. So interrupt it, right? If it's starting to get into an argument and it's not productive and it is becoming blaming and shaming, that's the facilitator's role. And that might be the head of the team or the head of the working group, or it might be a person who is designated as the facilitator. And that facilitator interrupts that pattern, right? And it might be interjecting yourself, which means talking over someone. Sometimes that's just what has to happen. And you just say, and then you start with that acknowledgement piece. I can tell that we're all feeling passionate about X, whatever is going on. And I really appreciate that. What do what needs to happen so that this conversation doesn't devolve or it might be i know that this is a serious issue i know you all have really strong feelings about it um how can we get back to the mission or the scope and so it's taking it it's really intervening in that moment and doing it in a way that isn't calling anybody out and embarrassing or shaming them in the meeting and it's using that that depersonalized language. And that's just one example. I don't know if Julie's got something else. So again, I, you know, there has to be someone in charge, as Erica mentioned, to be able to make these techniques work. Um, but to really make a meeting work in general, there has to be someone in charge. And I think I would take it back as quickly as I could to inquiry or shared exploration. So when we're 
when we're blaming about a particular issue, let's just keep using my example of not using an interpreter with a victim who requires one. I would just step over the conversation and ask three, two or three questions about it, right? So um, is, this, uh, is this an issue of training that the officers don't know? Is this a resource issue? Do we not have interpreters available um, speaking that particular language that this victim required? So I would just take the conversation back, still focused on the topic, but making it about the solvable aspect of it. Is it an individual training issue? Is it a resource issue? What, what needs to happen so that it doesn't happen again in the future? I'll put myself on mute. Um, so I don't see any questions or, you know, coming into the chat in the Q&A box, or I don't know if, Julie, if you're seeing any coming in on Mentimeter. Um, but no, I have not had any on Mentimeter. That's okay. We can wrap up and give folks nine minutes back of their day. But I just want to give a warm mahalo to Erica and Julie again for being our wonderful guest speakers um, for this training series. I hope everyone who participated was able to take away a lot of expertise and knowledge from them. They were so great. And thank you all for joining us on Zoom, as well as the team behind the scenes. And appreciate all your important work in reducing mm -hmm. domestic violence in your states. Aloha, happy Aloha Friday. Thank you, Julie. Thank and you. I just this, like right? <laughs> we all have a great day. Bye-bye, <laughs> all.